actually going to let Amy introduce herself and tell you guys a little bit about her and her business. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to um, talk with you guys all about making this upcoming tax season next year a lot less stressful. Um, <clears throat> but I'm an accountant that specializes in working with creatives. Um, I left my job at a CPA firm about five or six years ago, and um, I didn't want to completely ditch my CPA license and, and get out of it, but I wanted to have something that I enjoy doing every day. So that's kind of where I combined my love for um, the creative world with my CPA background and um, how I'm here today. So um, I... Um, I'm a new mom. I have a five month old little boy and I live in Indiana. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me and my background. Um, thank you so much. Um, Amy is, um, my CPA. She did our taxes for the last, for the last two seasons. Now we worked with her and we actually had a whole hot mess of things happen. That was not her fault. Um, and she was so great to work with to help us kind of navigate through that. It's always really scary whenever um, you're working on your taxes and you wanna make sure you know, you're know you dotting all those I's and crossing all those T's and doing things the right way. And so it was really great to have her there to guide my husband and I through it um, because there were some just nitty gritty details that we had to iron out with ours. So. Um, I love her and I'm happy that she's here. <laughs> um, so let's just go ahead and like jump right in and start talking about this. Um, I know for some of us, we can feel like, oh, well, out of sight, out of mind. It's not next April. I don't really want to focus on um, how I can prep for it. But the bottom <laughs> line is if we start prepping for our taxes now, it's going to make the entire process of filing your taxes so much easier, whether you're working with a CPA or not. And that's why I wanted to have um, have this coffee chat and bring Amy on because I've learned the hard way, the importance of doing things monthly um, or at least on like a quarterly basis, just some somehow making it um, a system in your business. <coughs> not stressed out and really overwhelmed in April when you're trying to get everything done. Um, so Amy, for you personally, like when do you begin working with clients on their taxes? And if someone isn't hiring a CPA, like when would you suggest that they start working on their taxes? Um, yeah, so I think it's kind of a year long process, you know, working on quarterly taxes. A lot of accountants or like old school CPAs will calculate, <coughs> excuse me, um, your quarterly taxes based on the prior year. But as all of us know, um, the prior year is probably not going to be indicative of your current year's taxes. So you could be way overpaying or way underpaying and be left with a huge stressful mess when you actually file your taxes. So unless you have a pretty good handle on how much you should send in for quarterly taxes and how to do that to the IRS and state, um, it might be a good idea to start talking with an accountant um, as early as now uh, to work on those quarterly taxes and um, figure out how much you should be paying in. Um, and just as a side note, um, you know, usually even with the tax changes that we've had, the tax laws, um, I still think that old rule of thumb that probably a lot of you guys have heard of like 30% is still probably pretty accurate. Um, it'll, it might way over um, estimate, but I think it's better to overestimate and get a good refund back than to underestimate and then owe a bunch later. So um, I think that's still a good rule of thumb. And then um, as far as reaching out to an accountant, uh, <coughs> if you are feeling pretty good about the quarterly taxes, then I think that um, usually around October, November is a good time to start interviewing accountants and um, getting onboarded with them. That's great. That's really good to know. And something um, just for all of you guys to think about too, um, obviously Amy, and she said it before, like she specializes in like creative small businesses. Um, and that was one of the reasons why like Matt and I felt really comfortable working with her because we liked that she would understand just the dynamic of our business maybe a little bit better than 
you know, an old school CPA or, you know, the brick and mortar store or the, the brick and mortar accountant, you know, like right down the road. Um, and so that's something that I think just can give you a lot of freedom when you're thinking about hiring a CPA is that if there isn't somebody in your town that you are um, maybe like interested in or you've heard, you know, great things about, you can have somebody virtual. I'm in Virginia. Like we're in totally different states. But yet I've never felt like, oh, she's not accessible to me because I can't just walk down, you know, or like drive down and make an appointment with her. Um, we can still have like virtual calls. I can, you know, send emails and ask questions like throughout the year. Um, so that's just something I um, always like to stress a little bit because I've gotten requests, especially like in my local like Tuesdays together group and things like that. Like people will ask like, well, who's your like local CPA? And I'm like, well, mine's not local, but she's still mm -hmm. awesome. So it doesn't have to necessarily be somebody local. If you find that working with somebody in that creative sphere like really fits your business better, um, that can um, be a good thing too for you. Yeah, and I always recommend just talking like, talk to your other friends in the industry and see who they're using and who they recommend. Um, because I think more than anything, that personal recommendation is gonna be huge. Um, they know they've gone through the process with the person and um, can give you their honest um, feedback as to how the process went. So I think that's going to be the biggest key in finding um, a really good fit. Yes, referrals are huge. So um, I definitely agree with that. Um, so what about so if someone is, um, you know, maybe they're sending in quarterly taxes um, based on maybe just that 30% number, right? Because they don't, they might not know like exactly. So they want to just go with that 30% mark. Um, so we're sending in quarterly taxes all year long. There's still so much more, right? That goes into then prepping for taxes besides just making sure that you've sent in those quarterly taxes. So what are some other tips and some things that like we could start doing again, like right now for next April to make sure that you're not just looking at all of these bank statements surrounding you. Like, again, guys, this has been me like printing everything from PayPal for an entire 12 month period with like a highlighter, like going through very, very stressful. Do not recommend it. Um, so what are some things that we can start doing right now to not have that happen next year? Um, so the big thing is going to be bookkeeping. I know everyone probably just like let out a groan because it's not fun, but um, bookkeeping is huge. So um, whether you want to do it yourself or hire that out, um, making a game plan for it is really important. And the very first step and the thing you can do this week if you haven't done it already is making sure that you have separate business bank accounts um, and including PayPal. Um, separating all of that out will, even if you did decide to wait until tax time to do all of that record keeping, you don't have to sift through all of your personal expenses and guess like was this target purchase for me or for the business so you know everything that went through your business accounts should be accounted for in some way so I think that's something super easy um, you can do and I will be honest just this week to send money to my friend I ended up opening a separate PayPal account I was really guilty about using my business PayPal account because it was so easy it was already set up it had funds in it from people paying me through the business. And um, I was like, you know what, enough's enough. I need to practice what I preach and get a separate PayPal account, even though I don't use it that often for personal stuff. So um, it's just something that's so nice to get crossed off your list and will help you a lot um, in terms of bookkeeping. Um, and then the other thing is um, when you do start bookkeeping, don't think you need to go like get a fancy program, you know, eat whatever you can do on a regular basis is going to be the best option for you. So whether that's using a spreadsheet, um, using QuickBooks, or if, if you know that you're not going to get to your bookkeeping on a monthly basis, hiring it out might be another option if you have the cash flow to do that. Mm -hmm. So would you, I feel like, like the term bookkeeping, sometimes people can not understand like exactly what that entails. Like, what is that? Like, what are those tasks? Like, what does that look like in your business, like on a regular basis? So would you mind like just kind of like bookkeeping for dummies for us first? Mm -hmm. kind of breaking down, like, what would that look like on a monthly or biweekly basis? Yeah, so um, bookkeeping is essentially just 
um, taking all of your transactions and putting them into a category bucket. So um, all of your income will go into an income bucket and then all of your expenses, um, you'll give them a name. So it doesn't have to be a specific name. It, there's no like special IRS list of names that you have to use. Um, you know, if you're a photographer and you, let's say you shoot newborns and you have a lot of props, then I would suggest creating a category for yourself called props. Um, so don't get hung up on what to call things because I think that really freaks people out. You know, use your best guess. Um, the IRS is not going to come audit you and say, you need to move this $10,000 worth of office expenses to supplies. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't truly matter um, that type of category. So just do do what you can. Um, and then in terms of like m systems on a monthly basis, um, I think the first thing, print out or print a PDF your bank statements for all of your accounts, very first thing. So go through PayPal. If you are using like HoneyBook or Dubsado or 17 Hats, um, Print out or export your sales reports. Um, same thing with your uh, checking account and your credit card. Get all of that gathered up. And then if you're using a spreadsheet, um, you could just simply import your transactions into a spreadsheet and then go line by line and just give them a category. And then um, what I do is I do, I just sort them by category and add up the totals. So, um, you know, if if spreadsheets aren't your thing or bookkeeping softwares just get too overwhelming, it can really be as simple as putting up, dumping everything in a spreadsheet and sorting it and totaling it up. Um, but essentially what you want to do is you want to mark off on your bank statements the, the transaction and then mark it off in your bookkeeping program. So whether it's your spreadsheet or it is um, QuickBooks, that process of marking it off in your statement and marking it off in your bookkeeping is called reconciling. Um, you're making sure that everything is accounted for, nothing is missing, nothing is duplicated. Um, so you'll want to do that at least every month because you know you have several accounts and you have several months built up. It can get to be a lot to catch up with. Absolutely, and so another. Um, I know you mentioned that we don't have to have like fancy software and fancy tools to do it. We can just, um, you know, download those statements and work with an Excel spreadsheet. But if we prefer maybe something that's like a little bit more systemized than that, and that will kind of help us with that download process, are there specific softwares that you recommend more than others? Um, yeah, I think a, a lot of people have heard about QuickBooks, and I think that's a great tool. Uh, they have basically two versions of it. They have the full QuickBooks that... Um, has been around forever and then they have QuickBooks self-employed which they've kind of taken out all the confusing parts of QuickBooks and really made it very simple so if you don't have um, inventory or you don't have the need to create a lot of custom categories then that's a really good option um, and they also have the quarterly tax estimator in there so if quarterly taxes are something that you um, really want to focus on, then um, that's just a little bonus that they have in there that's really nice. Um, if you want something free, Wave Apps um, is another good option. And, you know, if you get into it and you try it out and you hate it, then you're not out any money. You're just out a little bit of time trying to learn it. Right. So That's awesome. I have heard good things about Wave. We use QuickBooks. Um, mm -hmm. So we have Matt does the QuickBooks self-employed for one of our businesses. Um, and he handles that. And then for our other one, we actually work with Stephanie of Steadfast Bookkeeping. Um, mm -hmm. Amy and Stephanie work together quite a bit, which I loved. That was also really helpful to know that, like, they work together really well. So my bookkeeping and my CPA, like, everything can be intertwined a little bit more. Um, because I got to a point where I kept saying I was going to do it on my own, and I just, I wasn't. So I need yeah. to the bullet and hire a professional <laughs> to come mm -hmm. Uh, but with our one business and with our wedding planning business, Matt does it through QuickBooks Self-Employed. And it has been great because it did strip out a lot of the confusing things, um, at least for somebody, mm -hmm. for people who don't have like an accounting background, it kind of stripped away some of those things. So um, I can vouch for that one, you guys, um, if anybody's out there kind of like looking at different softwares and 
things like that. Um, what I saw Lauren asked a question here, so I thought we could go ahead and um, she popped it here into the chat and then a couple people were talking about it. It says, she said, if you work for multiple businesses, is it possible to set up one single business bank account to transfer money into, or should I set up a third LLC in my name to help with that process? And then she clarified and said, I work for two wedding planning companies right now. I am responsible for managing my own income expenses, but trying to figure out the easiest way for an accountant to view my income as a whole. Yeah, so since they're related, I would think of it just kind of as all one business, even though you're getting paid by um, a couple different wedding planning businesses, um, have all of the money being deposited to the same bank account, have all of your business expenses being paid through that same account. Um, don't think about it like you're running several businesses, even though it might feel that way by working with um, different people. Think of it as just your overall one business. Um, and let's say, like, let's say you decided to add on another branch to what you're doing and you offer a different related service. Like, let's say you wanted to do bridal showers and focus on that niche. I don't know. Um, it doesn't have to just be wedding planning. It can be like other little niches as long as they're, it's not like you're combining a bakery with jewelry making. Um, then you can keep it all together. That makes sense. So really just thinking about it in terms of the revenue streams. Of the mm -hmm. business, you can have one, um, like one bank account with multiple different revenue streams, but it's all under the same business. Yeah. And if you want to track the different revenue streams, um, which I find really interesting, like I have um, in QuickBooks, I track my course sales, my consulting, bookkeeping, taxes. I like to see what's making money and what's not. So I would suggest instead of putting it all into that one income bucket, um, separate it out. And so you can see how, how well um, things are doing and whether or not you're making a profit. Absolutely, I do that as well. And it really is so eye-opening. Um, and it's interesting to look back then, whether you're looking quarterly at your numbers, but then of course at the end of the year, you're looking at the whole year as a whole and to say like, oh, this one, this category did a lot better than like I expected it to this year or I thought it was going to, or maybe one, you were really marketing it, like you really wanted it to do well and it really didn't do as well. And then mm -hmm. you decide as a business, right? Like we wanna have profitable businesses, not hobbies. Is it worth keeping this revenue stream or, or if it's not worth it, like letting it go, if it is, what are some different marketing tactics and things you can try? Um, so I definitely think from like the strategy side of owning a business, um, knowing um, how much income each of those revenue streams are bringing in will be really, really helpful for you. Yeah. And, you know, even to continue on with the strategy part, like if you get to the end of the year and you've been busting your butt, but you break even, I mean, it's as if you you could have taken the whole year off and been in the same spot. So you really want to focus on that profit. We, we all love our businesses, but there's a million other things that we could do mm -hmm. to, make, to make no money. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, focusing on the profit of your business is really important. And um, some people are surprised in a good way and some people are surprised in a bad way at the end of the year. But by keeping up with your numbers each month, even just that simple spreadsheet, you can see, you know, my efforts are um, paying off or I need to switch gears um, and start thinking about my marketing strategies a little bit differently. Absolutely. That's really helpful. Um, so what is, um, besides like doing, um, the bookkeeping, like not that that's not a lot to do, <laughs> we're like, oh, just, you know, do your own bookkeeping every month. Um, but obviously like looking back at our books and really trying to uh, like understand like our profit loss, like really categorizing those expenses and having like a better handle on that. Is that something you would say, obviously like monthly is good. Um, or is it, would you even suggest like going smaller than that, like doing that bi-weekly? What do you recommend to your clients who aren't able to hire out, right? And they're doing it, like they're DIYing it. Um, so the way I do it, um, is kind of a combination. Like for my own books, I will keep QuickBooks up. I just keep it up as a tab, one of my thousands of tabs that are up. And, um, I just go in like, Sometimes every day, sometimes every week, and if it's like tax season and I'm super busy, it'll be every month. 
but um, just give everything a category. And then on the monthly basis, then I go in and do that reconciliation process where I'm making sure everything that's on my statements matches with what's showing up in QuickBooks. So by keeping up with it and just going through and spending a couple minutes a day or a couple minutes a week, um, it really cuts down on the pain of it, I feel like. Absolutely. And I've I mentioned this before, but if it's your first coffee chat or if you weren't able, you know, to tune in on this one, um, you may have missed it. But I have what's called duty days in my business. Um, so I block out one day a month is a duty day um, for me to handle any of those like kind of admin tasks, right, that are a little bit more mundane. There might not necessarily be like my favorite tasks in the world, but I need to get them done and I need to know that I've blocked off time to do them. So I would even challenge like all of you guys out there now, like going ahead and saying, okay, let me go ahead in May, in June, July, like marking off right now in your Google calendar, your, your like paper planner, whatever it is that you use and making that day a true day so that you won't book any appointments that day. You won't book other things. And now you have that time. So if you're not able to do what Amy's saying and kind of pop in a little bit more regularly throughout the month, at least you have that one day a month dedicated to looking back at those last four weeks and four weeks to look at is a lot less stressful than 12 weeks to look at at a time. And when she was even talking about like, I feel like I'll go to Target and then the next week I'm like, wait, why did I go to Target last week? Like it's, it's so easy to forget those things and to look back at those, um, at that expense line. So if we really factor that in as a, um, just a natural rhythm in our business, it can be really helpful and just, it'll save you time in the long run to take out those little chunks of time now. Yeah. And I like, even if you need to bribe yourself, because I know no one looks forward to doing their bookkeeping, but bribe yourself and go to a coffee shop, get out of the house and make it as fun as you can make it. You know, um, I think for me, it's kind of like going to the gym. I don't love doing it in the moment. Um, when I'm talking about my own bookkeeping, but once I'm done, I feel so much better. And then once I've gotten in the habit of doing it, it's not as painful. It still isn't great, but it's not as painful. Yes, I love that. Yeah, and you feel so accomplished. You're like, okay, I did mm -hmm. that. And now yeah. I can like go drink that like venti. I'm gonna treat myself to like the venti ice chai or uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great idea. Um, what is and this is like a super broad question, so there might not even be like a um one specific answer, but what is the like either the biggest or one of the biggest mistakes that you see small business owners make when prepping for tax season? Um, one thing that I've noticed is um sometimes like if you pay your income taxes or you even you pay yourself, um sometimes business owners include those as expenses for the business. And it it feels like that should be allowed because you wouldn't have to pay those taxes if you didn't have your business and you know you've done the work so you've paid yourself your payroll um so unless you're an s corporation you really shouldn't be including your payroll as an expense of the business or your income taxes um the reason that's such a big deal is because if you pay out most of your profit to yourself and you have been recording that as an expense, then it looks like you have not much profit that you need to pay tax on. So you're gonna be expecting a lot lower um, tax bill, but then when you or your accountant does your taxes and takes those out of consideration, then it's like, oh my gosh, I had a lot more profit than I thought and can be surprising. So that's one huge thing that I've noticed. That makes sense. And it's something we've done, Matt and I have done before. Because mm -hmm. um, you're right, you naturally think like, well, this should be an expense. Like I'm, I have to pay myself or I'm paying income tax or whatever it might be. And, mm -hmm. um, it stinks when you have to loop it back in as the overall profit. Um, yeah. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Are there any other like big mistakes that you feel like you've seen um, like your clients make in the past? Um, I think there's a couple smaller mistakes, but like one is just not tracking stuff like your mileage during the year. Okay. Um, it's such an easy thing to put off. Um, but if you use an app like Mile IQ, mm -hmm. that's a really popular one, especially like if you're a wedding planner or a photographer, 
um, you're driving so much. And I know that um, from my end, when my clients can just export those reports straight out of the program, mm -hmm. I just grab the totals, put it in the tax return, and we're done. And you don't have to go back through your calendar and add it all up for the year. So that's been a, a really good thing for my clients who've gotten in the habit of using that. Absolutely. I love mile IQ. I, I like that it of course will just run on my phone, you know, so when I'm in the car, it's, I'm not having to remember to track anything, but then I really do love that I can log in on my laptop pull up those reports and, you know, be able to categorize things even on, you know, like I can do it for the whole month. Like again, on that duty day guys, like that's one of my mm -hmm. other tasks is um, categorizing my mileage. What was it business or was it personal for that specific month? Um, and I like that I can pull it right up on my laptop. So then if I do have Google calendar up, you know, if I'm like, wait, was that the venue visit? Like which one was that? I can look really easily right there and be able to swipe and categorize. Um, and it's so helpful. Yeah. Um, and I think the other smaller mistake is just not worrying about taxes during the year, paying in quarterly taxes. So a lot of people say, oh, I'm in my first year. I don't have to pay taxes during the year. And that's kind of correct because you probably won't have to pay any penalties if you don't pay taxes during the year, but you'll still have to pay tax at the end of the year on your income. So um, sending in money throughout the year. Um, it just lowers that burden and that stress. And um, I heard another accountant say um, to think of it like self-care for yourself. So when she said that, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you are doing something for yourself that will benefit you later on mm -hmm. um, instead of always having that stress in the back of your head, like, oh, I'm going to owe so much and I've already spent all that money and at least it's out of your hands. And if you do overpay, the IRS will refund it. Um, so yeah, I think thinking about that really changed my mindset about them too. I love that. No, that's a really good analogy to think through. Mm -hmm. um, I see a, um, a question popped into like the ask a question section. So guys, if you all have any additional questions, please feel free to pop them in. We wanna make sure um, we answer as many as we can. Um, so feel free to start doing that and we'll um, tackle Heather's now. She said, how do you suggest dealing with the PayPal transaction fees? I know it's a business expense, but should we be showing the gross or net in our books? That's a really good question. So um, with PayPal or even HoneyBook or Stripe, they all take out a little fee uh, when you collect money through them. So what the IRS is going to see is they're going to see the gross income. And so gross means the money uh, before any fees are taken out. You, It's up to you to report the expense, which is the fee. Um, and sometimes if you reach a certain threshold, you'll get a 1099 from PayPal or the other merchant processors. And that 1099 tells the IRS, you should expect to see this much money on the income line. Um, reporting the net amount which is the amount after the fees are taken out as your income then there's they're not going to match up and so I've seen sometimes um, if only the net is reported an automatic notice will get sent out to you from the IRS and they're not you know you can easily explain your situation and get it taken care of but notices aren't fun so avoid that and um, report all of your money at the full gross amount and then um, either in QuickBooks or whatever your bookkeeping software is, report that expense to reduce it back to what you actually received. Um, it's a little bit more work, but you know, it's worth not having to deal with the notice later on. Absolutely. So they should just, well, all of, not just they, me too, like everyone should just um, make sure that the transaction fees are categorized as an expense. So when mm -hmm. you're doing your bookkeeping, like on that regular basis, just making sure that it's categorized as an expense. So that way, when you do report it, you're reporting gross, but then showing the expense line for what was yeah. there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Really helpful. That was a great question, Heather. Um, if you guys have any additional questions for 
Um, I would say Amy or I, but really not me because Amy is the expert in this situation. Um, please feel free <laughs> to um, pop them in and we'd love to, um, we love to answer them now and just to make sure you guys feel really comfortable um, as you start to move forward throughout the, the next um, uh, few quarters of the year and, you know, can really get like a much better handle and a much better understanding on what like your bookkeeping process and just you know, in getting prepared for taxes, like what that should look like. Um, I know you mentioned, is there a, and this might just be like such mm -hmm. a silly question, but I'll just throw it out there. Like while we're kind of seeing if anybody else pops in any, is there um, a penal, I know some people can file, like need to file extensions. Is that like, a, like, does the IRS look at that as like a penalty kind of like a little flag is like put on you if you have to file an extension on one particular year or how does that process work? Um, yeah, so I don't think that the IRS um, looks at you extra if you file an extension. Um, I think the things that are red flags are, you know, if one year you have meals and entertainment expense of $1,000 and the next year it's $15,000, um, that they have some formula and I don't know exactly how it all works, but they have some formula that calculates like, they'll give you like a certain points. Um, towards like if you have a huge increase in a certain type of expense, you'll get points for that. Um, if your points are, you know, probably above a certain threshold, then you might get flagged for an audit. But it's, um, so I don't know all of the different calculations. That's kind of basically how it works. Um, so many people do extensions now that that isn't going to be enough of a reason for them to want to look into you. Um, same thing with the home office. I, I get that question a lot like, oh, I'm nervous to take a home office deduction because I heard that that, you know, sends up a red flag to the IRS. But if you think about how many people now have a home office versus like back when our parents were younger and it maybe was a red flag for them, um, it's it's like, I don't know, even know how many more times there are um, of people with home offices. So as long as you truly have a space where you are regularly and exclusively using it for business, um, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't worry about it. Even if the IRS were to ask you about it, um, I would just take pictures of your home office and um, use that as your proof that it's not also um, being used as your kitchen area you know um so that's awesome. that's another it's, thing it's like that's kind of like, just one of those things where you're like don't do that because they're gonna fight you for an audit um but i know i mean even with working with you like we mm -hmm. have a space that is used regularly and exclusively so we're able to you know like have that as an expense like write that off on our taxes of working from home um Oh, Emily, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, I see Sarah asked a question. Um, she said, do you have any recommendations for a class or books to read that are simple that cover the basis for running a small business? And I'll even ask you to clarify a little bit, Sarah, are there, are you thinking specifically on like the accounting, like bookkeeping side of it? Or just could you clarify a little bit of exactly what you're looking for? That would be helpful. And Amy, I don't know if you have anything on like the accounting side that you would um, recommend. Yeah, um, so I mean, not to plug my own course, but I do have, um, I did create a course based on the need that I was seeing. Um, I essentially combined a ton of the questions I was seeing over and over again on the consulting calls I was doing and put it into a six lesson course. Um, I tried to make it pretty and um, the, the lesson short so that it wasn't overwhelming and um, so I have something available. I know like if you want to go the uh, free route, there are like if you're trying to learn QuickBooks, QuickBooks has free um, tutorials and lessons on how to use their programs. Um, all of the like Wave has the same thing. So 
Um, That's awesome. There's a lot and one of thing free I just stuff out there website, too. But I am also going to pop in. Um, you have that quarterly tax payment calculator. That's really helpful as well. So if you're sitting there thinking, okay, okay do I really mm-hmm. want to do 30% each quarter? Like, how can I get a little bit more exact? Like, how do I know? Um, this might be really a really great resource for you guys to look at um, and help you figure out that specific to, you know, your quarterly taxes, but at least that's one big to do. You know, you could kind of check off by looking at her calculator. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Let's see. Good, Sarah. I'm glad that was helpful. Um, Jay, is it a headache to have prior year tax returns revised, resubmitted? Is there, if there were major errors made on them? Um, it's not that bad. Um, so basically what you do is you file an amended return. If the changes also affect your state return, you'll need to file a state amended return as well. Um, I use, so it's not difficult for me. I haven't ever tried using like TurboTax or, um, just filling out the pages manually. Essentially what I do is, um, I make the changes in the tax return in my software and it records those changes and reports it on the form. So um, it might be something, unless it's just like one very simple change, it might be something worth working with an accountant on. Um, Just from a headache perspective, I would hate for you to spend like hours or even days on trying to look through all of the instructions line by line and, um, when you could just pay probably a couple hundred dollars to have but I'm all, do again, it. I already told you guys, I get overwhelmed with the tax and bookkeeping side, and it's just easier for me to hire somebody that I know knows what they're doing and us to do it. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because, like, me and my husband are really DIYers, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of small businesses are that way, um, you know, to save money and because – you know, we like to learn things and try things out ourselves. So, um, you know, when it comes to the bookkeeping, even sometimes taxes, if your taxes are fairly simple, doing it yourself isn't shameful or bad in any way. Um, as long as you feel comfortable with doing it, um, it's just when those weird things come up, like if you move states or you have to do an amendment or something like that comes up, um, it's nice to have Absolutely. somebody on your side yeah, that sometimes, can guide like you, you said, that we like stuff. to bootstrap a lot of things because we love it and we're entrepreneurs, but we have to just admit that we're not the expert in every aspect of our business. Um, and it's nice to just have the expert come in and help us navigate through, especially mm-hmm. when things are getting a little bit tricky or a little bit sticky. Yeah. 